It's the second time around trying to get the Blue and the John Crow Mountains on the prestigious list of World Heritage Sites. Well, the World Heritage List is really a property-based list. It's a property-based convention and really what it is is that there are over 980 sites on the World Heritage List. If Jamaica gets on the list, there are only, as it, as it stands, 29 mixed sites within the whole 980. And really, there is a significant amount of prestige associated with being on the World Heritage List. There is a big niche for tourism as well. There is a significant benefit for the community as well, because they will also be impacted heavily by the amount of exposure the site brings. The area selected for Jamaica's historic bid spans three parishes. What we are looking at here is the entire nominated property for the Blue and Jonker Mountains uh, property that we have submitted for the, for the nomination to UNESCO. And what we have here on the inside of the Blue Line is actually the nominated property spanning um, St. Thomas, Portland and a small part of St. Andrew. The entire property, however, from the, the black line in the lighter green area, that is the buffer zone for the, the property. And it is actually the Blue and Jonco Mountains National Park. The Jamaica National Heritage Trust has redefined the boundaries in a move to protect the sections of the Blue and the Jonco Mountains, which are being submitted to UNESCO for consideration. What the Jamaica National Heritage Trust has done in trying to protect the entire site is that we have closed up the area that would have been left out before, that would have been left out in the boundaries of the Blue and Jonker Mountains National Park. And we have made the entire area, named the entire area Protected National Heritage. So the site is actually protected under three pieces of legislation, the NRC Act, the Forestry Act, and the Jamaica National Heritage Trust Act. Instead of putting forward the entire Blue and John Crow Mountains for consideration, the boundaries for this bid were influenced by the area's cultural history and biodiversity. What we chose for the boundaries of the site included really what is the most pristine area of the Blue and John Crow Mountains National Park because the nominated property is found within the national park and really the, the National Park is, is managed by the Jamaica Conservation and Development Trust. And when we cons you know, spoke to all our stakeholders, I mean, including the Maroon community, what we found was that this area was the most pristine as it protected the significant cultural heritage as well as the natural heritage of the site. So this area, the boundaries that we had identified, really covers significantly the, the maroon heritage and the natural heritage of the saint. The area is home to the Moortown Maroons who are direct descendants of national heroine Nanny. We are walking down the step now. We are going towards the place where Granny Nanny was buried. In this very same area is where she was buried. There's another tomb right there and there are several tombs all over the place. Anywhere these stones are, there's, that is where the tombs are. And Granny Nanny was buried here. There are several other tombs all around here because this is Bump Grave, the cemetery, and this is one of the oldest cemeteries in the community. The history of the Maroons and the tales of Nanny's fearlessness in battle is a major plank on which Jamaica's submission is built. And Bump Grave is actually the burial site of Granny Nanny and other Maroon warriors who were living here in the very early part. So it, it, it predates the cemetery that is done by the Anglican Church. When you look around, um, all of the stones that you see are really part of the tombs of those persons who were buried here. Granny Nanny herself was buried here. Not where we are standing, but at the back of the, the monument. There's nobody that is buried on top of this. Yeah, you're buried around the side of it. And to the extent that that side was really a part of the cemetery. And over there, to our right, is the Asafo yard. Are the, the training ground, the place where the warriors would train, and where the meetings would be held. So, and meetings in a maroon community back then, community meetings were, were always held close to the cemetery, in the earshot of the ancestors that would have passed on.
Nanny Falls is also very important to the Moortown Maroons and its purported healing properties make it more appealing. This is a very famous waterfall. This is where people would have come when you were sick and you were given a bath and you come here and get another bath to wash you up, to heal you of your various ailments that people would have had, right? So, and because Nanny herself was the person who would administer all of those things, that is why we call it Nanny's Falls. So now people still come here and they enjoy themselves, but you have to make necessary preparation with the kind of you know, plants and herbs that you need to get that kind of healing from, from what is being done here. The St. Paul Anglican Church is among the oldest in Jamaica and is one of the first churches in which the Maroons worshipped. History and tradition are strong in Moortown and the Maroons expect to benefit tremendously if Jamaica is successful in its bid to have the Blue and John Crow Mountains named among the World Heritage Sites. We think that going forward with the Maroon as a team, as one of the major aspects in this nomination, then we have a good chance of getting this um, recognition from UNESCO. Bearing in mind that in the past, the, the music of the Motown Maroon was nominated as an oral masterpiece by the United Nations as well. So it's just a matter of adding something more to the list that will help to further enhance the area because by so doing, when we get that kind of recognition, more people will be coming into the area. More people coming into the area as visitors, it means employment for more people and it means empowering people to protect the environment even more. Because we're not looking to, to, to gain from this, like, you know, like the, the kind of what you call the sun and sun tourists. You're looking people who are more eco-friendly, people who are interested in heritage tourism, you know, cultural tourism. Those are the kind of visitors that we hope we can attract to this area. The site is really one that is of mixed, and mixed heritage, natural and cultural heritage. It was put forward because of the strong cultural heritage found in the Maroon, as well the Windward Maroons, as well as the natural heritage found in endemic species, snakes, frogs, you know, butterflies. That kind of heritage is what is inherent in the Blanc Jonker Mountain. Yes.